Well, there it is. My beloved California absolutely blanketed by smoke. Somehow both apocalyptic and beautiful at the same time. Some would say it's not the best idea to head right into this. Least of all during a freaking pandemic. But here I am with my mask collection, double pumps of hand sanitizer, and my RV bubble that contains these two fine companions. Like me, they have been tested, layered with protocols, and chosen to interact with the world. Our mission is to head out on Route 395. It's a road that runs down California's eastern spine and that offers up unfair amounts of spectacular sights. The kinds of things that still produce wonder amid a smoky haze. I mean, come on. Along the way, we'll be visiting some of the tech world's outliers, people that like to live and work on the frontier. They're folks trying to feed the planet, fix it, or if need be, just get off it. If thinking different is your thing, then here we go. Show us the way, rented RV with your included dashboard ornament. Show us the way. If you're going to drive an RV through a fiery hellscape during a pandemic, you want to be sure and do it right alongside a massive active fault system. In this case, may I present the Walker Lane, which is often found hugging Route 395. While not as well known as, say, the San Andreas Fault, it's the Walker Lane that gives 395 much of its charm. We're talking hot springs, extinct volcanoes, and mountains. And we're talking more apocalypse, because it's now thought that the Walker Lane may result in Reno ending up as a beach town. Who predicts such things? Well, for one, this man, geologist James Falls, who forced me to climb his hill near Reno to learn about the fault. We are in the middle of the uh, what's called the Walker Lane. And it's a big belt of faults in western Nevada, also eastern California. The San Andreas accommodates about 80% of the motion between the Pacific and North American plates. And about 20, maybe as much as 25% of that motion is over here on, on the Walker Lane. Falls is one of a growing number of geologists who have become obsessed by the Walker Lane Fault and what it could mean for residents of California and Nevada in the distant future. People focus so much on the San Andreas Fault and what this could mean and in 10 million years to the, the geography of the United States and California. But I mean, there is the potential that this fault could be more, even more dramatic if, if, if some of these theories are right. We know the Walker Lane is growing northward along with the San Andreas. So they're scheduled to meet somewhere off the southern Oregon coast in about maybe seven or eight million years. And what, and what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, when that happens, what some of us think will occur is and that the entire San Andreas then will sort of rip up through the uh, western part of uh, North America or the, or the U.S. And it'll strand California off to the west. I mean, the Pacific Ocean ends up kind of rushing through parts of Nevada, right? Well, or is that yeah, is this, not, is yeah, this controversial? It'll, it'll, be, it'll be a slow process, but we may have beachfront property in Reno someday. This fault also sort of brings along some opportunities, right? We have these crustal motions in the region, and in Nevada, there's a stretching of the crust, stretching in the horizontal dimension, and that helps to kind of dilate or open up faults, and that brings hot water up closer to the surface, and then that can be tapped for geothermal energy. What's that, Jim? Did you say geothermal energy? Well then, 
Let's have a brief musical interlude as we gaze upon the nearby geothermal plant of Ormont. It's got everything. Awesome fans. I mean, really awesome fans. Wells that tap into geothermal brine 10,000 feet underground. Sweet, sweet pipes and transmission lines. Turbines that you can't really see on either side of this generator. Enough juice for 22,000 homes. The Walker Lane Fault in action. Back to you, Jim. And then part of the reason there was any controversy or we didn't even know that much about this fault was, was 20 years ago. It was much harder to gather data about this kind of thing. The fault wasn't as clear uh, when, when you looked down. And so what is this device? Uh, this is a GPS station. So it's actually communicating with satellites. Its position is changing through time and those satellites are tracking those changes down to the scale of millimeters. How many are monitoring the fault? There's 400 of these sensors in this region in a uh, network called Magnet. These stations allow us to sort of focus in on maybe what, what the most important part of the region uh, might be. Like how much activity um, are people around here seeing as a result of the fault? Nevada is the third, third most seismically active state after Alaska and California. After our chat, James drove off and left me with that unique brand of existential dread that comes from learning about the perils of your surroundings and what will befall humankind. To get rid of all that, I had only one option. A night spent at the splendid Grand Sierra Resort and Casino RV Park, where, as it turns out, you can still get DoorDash and eat your sorrows away. All right, let's see what it says to find JP. Google Maps will get you close to the mailbox, but not exactly there. Expect a long gravel driveway. You got it? Yeah. From Reno, we headed south to Carson City. Well, like the outermost edge of Carson City, where an old friend is engineering a most unique existence. Today, we're a little bit outside of Carson City, Nevada, going to the house of J.B. Straubel. He's a guy I've known for a long time. He was one of the first employees at Tesla and uh, the longtime chief technology officer. I always thought of him as, as the heart and soul of Tesla because he was this guy who, even before Tesla was a real thing, he was obsessed with solar-powered cars, with taking lithium ion batteries and using them to one day reshape the automotive industry. He was kind of the dreamer behind the technology in the whole electric car revolution. A couple years ago, he decided he was gonna go out on his own and start a new company around recycling all these lithium ion batteries that he helped create. We're gonna learn a little bit more about his life and then we're gonna go see his new factory as well. What is that Model 3? Yeah, looks like it. Oh, there's another. There's one three. Tesla, two Teslas. Three in the back. Hey guys, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for letting us do all this. Yeah. You've like always constantly got some project going on at home or one or another. I mean, I, I love building things and you know, I kind of do this sort of stuff to relax. This is the current project. Yeah, this is just sort of a side fun project, but it's a you know an interesting experiment and in being able to do this you know cheaply and quickly and find ways to deploy solar without heavy equipment and it's just fun. And then even though you ran Tesla's energy division, you still want to you're building your own battery pack, right? <laughs> it's I don't know. I find more fun in the process. You yeah. know, it's you can pay someone to do something and then it's just done. And but uh, I think it's almost more the journey and the you know, the mental exercise of thinking through it. JB started coming out here as Tesla began building its massive Gigafactory battery plant. Year by year, the charms of Nevada grew on him, and he decided to stop living in hotels and take over this fine compound. Over the years, Elon Musk has gotten all of the Tesla love and adoration. Meanwhile, JB quietly did his thing in the background. Always a tinkerer and engineer at heart, he spearheaded many of Tesla's key projects before leaving the company in 2019. You come from a long line of, of tinkerers. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about like, your dad and, and your grandparents. And... My great-grandfather actually uh, you know, immigrated here from Germany 
and uh, started uh, an engine company in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And they, you know, he actually built and machined some of the very first internal combustion engines for boats back then, for fishing boats. I mean, it must be in the blood to some degree, because I know, I mean, you were tinkering from like what, when you were a teenager or even before that? I just enjoy it. You know, it doesn't, it was, wasn't necessarily a, you know, a means to an end. It was just something fun to do and um, building things, taking stuff apart. It's, yeah, it's what I do for fun. Even in the early days, you know, I still remember my dad taking me on, you know, tours of power plants when I was, you know, like this tall and didn't know quite what I was looking at, but I thought it was all super cool and I actually really loved chemistry in high school. That was probably my favorite subject back then. And, you know, I had built a, you know, a whole chemistry lab in the basement and was, you know, trying to learn about all that on my own and understand, you know, batteries and electrochemistry stuff, uh, even back then. You went to Stanford, and at Stanford you worked on, obviously this carried over, because you end up working on, on the solar racing team, and, and I mean, did you feel like there was a revolution coming, or this was just something that was interesting to you? Well, it, it, it felt early, you know, it was, you know, things hadn't taken off, and it was very, um, you know, almost contrarian a little bit, thinking about solar and solar car racing and this kind of stuff. I had an inkling that we were kind of at the beginning of, of that transition and you could clearly see the potential. Overlapping into the end of that is, is when, you know, I, I was spending much more time, you know, really digging into, you know, the earliest days of electric vehicles and starting to think more about lithium ion batteries. And the solar car racing stuff was, was really the first, you know, on-road application of anything like that. At some point there was a race and, and the team ends up crashing at your house. And this is right when the lithium ion batteries are turning up and all these consumer electronic devices. I mean, tell me the story, wasn't this like the moment where you guys were like, maybe we could lash all these things together? And I was actually living in Los Angeles at the time in Glendale. And it was only a few miles away from where the race ended. I, I called my buddies and was like, oh, well, come on over. It's fun. You know, let's, we'll, we'll hang out and you can all crash in the living room. So we ended up, you know, staying up, you know, most of the night, you know, reminiscing about the race and talking about the technology and how it worked and, and, you know, hatched this crazy project, you know, to, um, to build, you know, a long range electric car, ditch the solar panels and just see if we could drive, you know, almost a thousand miles on on electricity alone. It really, I just fell in love with it. And it, it, you know, was such a fun project that just felt like it had to be done. You know, I saw no one else doing it and wanted to throw myself into it. And in those days, Southern California was kind of, you know, the mecca for, you know, the early stages of electric, electric cars and batteries. So it was a good place to be. You end up with this guy, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarberding, they want to make an, an all electric sports car. You've got Elon, down in LA, he, he's also kind of interested in this idea and happens to have a lot of money. And um, and eventually these forces combine and then and then you're right there at the very beginning as well. There's some of the best times, you know, thinking back on it, but it, it also, you know, we had no idea what we were up against, you know, and, and trying to imagine what it would become. Um, I mean, it was just a handful of people, you yeah. know, and you know, no one had ever tried this stuff before. And, and that was the beginning of, you know, how we started to understand large format batteries and how to architect the safety of, of that. And so then that was the challenge, right? I mean, was you guys were worried about obviously fires and, and then like how you cool these things and there were explosions in the, the neighborhood. And <laughs> well, it was, it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, we, we were fearless and we just, you know, plunge into this and, you know, knowing that somehow we'd figured this stuff out. But uh, yeah, I mean, that we kind of built it off the experience that came out of even those earliest solar car experiments but scaled it way up yeah. and had, you know, the support of a growing engineering team and, and uh, you know, more and more interest and focus to really, you know, create what became, you know, the Roadster. Well, this is a, this is a really old Roadster. This was actually one of our uh, first uh, engineering prototypes. Engineering prototype five is what we called it. So a little bit before we started series production. You know, years ago we refurbished it and uh, I sort of collected this thing and have taken care of it since. I believe it's the oldest Tesla that's on the road still. Does it give you like PTSD <laughs> or, or only fond no, memories? Only, at this only, point? only fond memories. It's it's a great thing to you know get in there and remember what EVs were you know were like not that long ago, and it's yeah. incredible how fast the development has happened. These days, JB is all about batteries and what we should do with them. He left Tesla to start Redwood Materials. At its heart, it's a battery recycling company. But looked at another way, it's sort of like a lithium or nickel mine, just in reverse. Sort of a 
startling amount of phones. This is, this is a big bit of phones, man. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> one of many. Redwood has a lot of batteries. I believe the technical term is a ton. Consumers send them in, so do companies. This is basically some of the incoming material that, that we get you know, from consumers. So you know, it's a whole variety of stuff, just 18650s. Scooter battery pack, even you know, power tool battery packs. It's like a, a power pack thing, yeah. you know, but this has a battery in it. So you know, it's, it's difficult to dispose of and we can recycle this for the materials. We're inventing the ways you know, that you can basically recycle this without having a human do it because yeah. it's too small. How much lithium that's been used in here would you guys be able to recover like, what's the reuse percentage? On Almost all like of that? it. You know, lithium, maybe more than 80 percent. You know, nickel, 95, 98 percent. Same with cobalt um, and copper. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty complete process. Redwood gets devices, takes out the batteries, and then begins breaking them down into their elemental parts. This is largely done through heat. Serious heat. Which is why these spacemen are needed. They're using an oven to create what is basically metal magma, which then goes into a tub and is stirred with a rake. Because why not? Redwood then goes through chemical and other processes to end up here. Mounds of stuff that was once pulled from the ground and can now be reused. So we got some more metal over here. Yeah, this is just a, a, a small batch of lithium carbonate that we just made this morning. And this is sort of a... Uh, a chance to see you know, what the, the final product is and what lithium actually looks like you know, once you extract it from the batteries and separate it yeah. out. So you know, this stuff is, is quite pure lithium carbonate. So this is actually the, the input precursor of how lithium gets you know, used and built back into batteries. It is pretty neat to see it separated like this and, and uh, you know, know that this came from batteries you know, that were you know, otherwise you know, garbage and otherwise wouldn't have been recovered. I mean, it's like the lithium, say it's been in my phone and you guys refine it. How many times can that happen? Can this just keep going on and on and on? <laughs> there, there's, no tip, there's no real limit to it. There's no degradation that happens to those atoms of lithium or cobalt or nickel. And it's one of the coolest things about this is that those metals are basically infinitely recyclable. Except for the small amounts that get lost in the recycling process itself, you can basically keep doing that again and again and again. So you can start to imagine a future where you're thinking, huh, like if we can do this a thousand times, you know, the need for mining new materials starts to dwindle. That's cool. After a hard day of alchemy, JB will head home and tend to his nerd garden. That might mean expanding the solar farm or fiddling with his homemade mountaintop internet repeaters. Or obviously, letting that still running, sexy yellow roadster loose. Remember kids, study hard, work hard, find a super rich friend with a Mars fetish who believes in electric cars just as much as you do. And this can all be yours too. If you visit California, you might be inclined to go to Disneyland or jump in your convertible and take Highway 1 up the coast or maybe make a pilgrimage to Yosemite. All very fine choices. But if you're the kind of person who revels in our planet's extremes, then it's Route 395 that you're after. <laughs> This one glorious road will carry you from Death Valley's desert floor to sky-high views of Mount Whitney. You can see the 5,000-year-old bristlecone pines, the oldest living organisms. Or the bizarre Tufa Towers of Mono Lake. And true to California's boom and bust spirit, you can saunter around the ghost town of Bodie. What a novel experience to find an empty American city where all the businesses are shut down. To 
To do 395 upright, it helps to have a guide. And mine is a man named Jan and his crew. Back here. <laughs> Heron. Let's tidy up first. And Lemmy, the hardest partying dog of all time. Jan agreed to show me some of what 395 has to offer, but only if we agreed not to disclose any locations. My name is Jan Swerstra. I'm an industrial designer out of LA, and uh, I spend a lot of time camping and a lot of time in the Eastern Sierra. It's a place I love. And uh, sometimes I'm known as 395 North because On Instagram. This, yep, my Instagram account. And um, I don't like to be known as that, but I'm trying to use it to set a good example and do more with it than just social media. Where did we end up camping? We got here late last night. I wasn't even sure where we are. This is uh, BLM land, right on the outskirts of National Forest. And uh, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Basically, <clears throat> everything outdoors wrapped into one. Yeah. yeah. Good thing about California, man. Oh, <laughs> man. We have so much national forest and public land yeah. that you can literally just cruise out and find a place to camp. It's ours. What I wish was mine is Jan's sweet truck. It's a uh, 2019 Ford Ranger. Has about 200 watts of solar in it and uh, a fridge and has everything that an RV has except for a toilet, yeah. but just on a smaller, simple scale. And you drive us around day to day in LA yep. and then just roll out yep. when you it's, want. It's my daily driver, um, handles great. Um, and then when I'm done with work, I can just bail and go camping. Get out. So the camper basically has only what I need. Think of it as backpacking with a car. Yeah. The fridge has a couple compartments. This is just a kitchen box, stove, utensils, and a bunch of stuff. This one has uh, just dry food. Then when you get inside, there's a bed. The bed flips up, so you've got tons of room in here. This awning is phenomenal. I'm gonna pull that over. That is cool. Let me just pop that up. Sort of. So, home on wheels. Yeah. This is my uh, vacation house. Dude, it's so nice, man. Even with his nomad lifestyle, Jan faces the same big question as the rest of us. Do the internet and smartphones have to ruin everything? when you find the super special, beautiful spots, is that um, you busting out a map and like looking where it might be cool to go, or is it word of mouth and just getting to know people, the locals? And If I see a dirt road, I just want to go down it. So a lot of it's just aimless rambling. Um, it's a desire to just see something. Check that out. For some reason, it's more fulfilling than getting a recommendation from somebody or you know, there's tons of apps and websites now road trip apps camping apps they've proliferated the knowledge is accessible on the internet right i, I used to fight the geotags and and i would get really pissed off be like why are you posting this place it's going to blow up it's going to get trashed now i've realized that you you can't fight it the internet has just shrunk the world so we're not going to stop it. We're not going to stop people from going there. So I'm a lot more focused in conversation now with trying to set a good example. When you go, pick up your trash. When you're pooping out in the wilderness, don't leave your toilet paper on the top. You know, make sure you follow, you know, good steps for leaving no trace. As a thank you for this quick guide to pooping etiquette, we made Jan, Heron, and Lemmy some tacos. And we all took in the night sky and knocked back a couple of drinks. Take that, Apocalypse. The thing about good times and serenity in 2020 is that they're fleeting at best. After we split up from Jan and continued on our way, smoke started to envelop us. The 
plus side was that our RV no longer smelled like feet. The downside was breathing. My man David here suggested that we try and outflank the smoke by cutting through Yosemite. Without a reservation, we had to talk our way in. Uh, yes, no stopping, no getting out, and... Yeah, don't go in the valley! Yeah, no, no problem, we just, yeah, we just wanted to get through. It was a beautiful choice. Glad we got out of the smoke. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! Okay. But not quite as effective as we had hoped. Fast forward four hours or so, and we had managed to trade the smoky majesty of Yosemite for the smoky, uh, Look at it. strip malls of the Central Valley. We have made it sort of out of the smoke all the way across Yosemite National Park and here to the gorgeous Central Valley of California. We're off to see a kind of surprising tech startup that is making some pretty strange machines to serve all the growers out in this region. And where, so we're here in this near Fresno, this is California farm country, right? Uh, we're just south of Fresno, a town called Kingsburg. So we're right in the Central Valley um, of California. Very, very large um, farming valley here. Um, it's kind of considered the breadbasket of, of the world. The Central Valley stretches out over about 20,000 square miles. And the farmers here produce about one fourth of the food that Americans eat, including a whole lot of fruits and nuts. Tell me a little bit of the background of, of Gus. I know some of this is like a family business. The, the roots of this go back a ways. Tell me kind of like how we, we got to what's essentially like a startup, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So the founder of our company is Dave Crinklaw, and he started the business back in 1982. He started with is basically with his dad was commercial spraying of trees and vineyards got to the point where our biggest challenge was labor, um, just the shortage of it, really. He was forced into innovating, and he had had this idea for quite some time about doing a, a driverless sprayer, and it finally got to the point where he said, you know what, I either gotta get out of this business or I'm gonna innovate. Organic or not, crops need to be sprayed, and this process has to take place a few times a year. This means hiring a lot of people to work long hours under serious pressure. And so, just like the tech bros to the north, Gus decided to solve all of its problems with robots. On this like labor point, you guys have set this up where you can have somebody in a truck and, and that one person can monitor, I think like eight of these. In order to operate Gus, you have one guy or girl that sits in a pickup and they monitor from a laptop computer. So that person is basically just watching all the vehicles on the screen. They can monitor up to eight of them at a time while they're out there spraying in the orchard. And so that user interface really provides them with all the information they need to make sure that the machines are safe and that they're doing the correct job. So it tells them what speed they're driving, the engine RPM, the amount of uh, gallonage per acre that they're applying at any given time. So if any one of the machines has an issue, it's going to send an alert to that laptop. Much like a self-driving car, these beasts use GPS, LiDAR, and cameras to see and navigate the world around them. They also rely on pre-built maps of the orchards for extra guidance. Gus builds the machines right here and then takes them out for robot training on this orchard next door. It's here that the company learns if the machines will behave and do as their software and human masters command. So this, so this is kind of like the, this is a test orchard where you guys put it through the paces and work on the technology? Yeah, so this is our, our test um, orchard right here. It's right by our building, as you can see in the background. So every new machine, as it comes off the assembly line, it's put through a commissioning test right here. We test all the sensors on the machine, uh, autonomous computer, all the safety systems make sure it's doing what it's doing, 
prior to when it's delivered to a customer. So what's it doing now? So right now he's doing a test spray. So he's just turning the water on to make sure that the system comes up to pressure, um, spraying water out of the nozzles just to make sure it's all functioning properly. Okay. It's got like a crazy turbine at the back or? Yeah, so it's basically just a big fan. Okay. And that fan's driven off of the uh, Cummins diesel motor and it just basically creates a big airflow. Gus is already selling these vehicles to brave modern farmers. And people the world over have taken notice of its machines. And have you just sold them in the Central Valley or like throughout the U.S. or even overseas? Or where, like where are they going? Yeah, so <laughs> right now um, the majority of our machines are here in California in the Central Valley. Uh, however, we do have machines and customers in Florida and the citrus industry over there, as well as Australia. And I think you started selling them in like December of 2019? Yeah, right? so we started taking orders um, early last year for the sprayers, and the first deliveries uh, we made were in December of 2019. Okay, so. and they, how much do they cost each? Um, so our, our retail price on these machines is $285,000. So it's like it's not a small investment, but I'm sure the regular sprayers aren't, aren't cheap Yeah, either. I mean, we're, we're honestly not too far away from conventional equipment on our price. And the main thing is, is that the return on investment is very, very quick um, due to all the labor savings and the increased efficiency. I mean, these machines, they just, they just drive. Uh, but basically what we're doing, besides this machine, this is our, our first machine, we call it Orchard Gus, uh, mainly designed for your your nut trees, um, as well as citrus and fruit. In the future, we're working on a few other projects. We're gonna do more machines. One of them is actually a vineyard sprayer. So okay. vineyards are much tighter spacing. So the machine has to be physically smaller. Um, and then we've got our eyes on doing a lot of other innovating. That right there, friends, is a Central Valley farmer putting his whole fruit basket on the table. Gary's TED Talk can't be far off. And with that, it was time to get back in the RV and to confront what happens when three men are bested by their own failings and the forces of entropy. Ah, the perks of RV life. It's late at night. You're tired. You spot a desert campground. Pull in and set up shop. Buttons are pushed to pop out your pop-outs. A once crammed disaster zone becomes livable for a while. And, best of all, you've blindly stumbled onto somewhere like Red Rock Canyon. And, well, it has much to offer and many ways to soothe your soul. Also, steaks. Make a couple of ribeyes, some mac and cheese. It's like our first real food we've had <laughs> in a few days. It's lettuce sandwich. <laughs> David Nicholson, ladies and gentlemen. Hello world director. We've got vegetables, Bob. This is good. Re-energized by Kraft's top powderologists and some instant coffee, we make our move toward the city of Mojave, one of my favorite places in the world. It's the home to the great windmill forests, to neighborhoods full of hardworking, and possibly hard-living people. 
and most notably, to aerospace adventurers of all stripes. For decades, the Mojave Air and Spaceport has been the place where you test out weird new crafts, be they supersonic jets or space planes. The folks I want to see are as Mojave as it gets, and they have set their sights on the moon. We're off to see Mast in Space, uh, which I guess you could consider a startup in the new space industry, except they've been here at the Mojave Airport for about 15 or 16 years. It's a fascinating company. Mast in Space was founded in 2004 by this guy, Dave Mastin. It is said that he is shy or elusive or both. So here I am with this guy, Sean Mahoney, the longtime CEO of Mastin. This is where Mastin started? Yeah. This was the original building. We've reconfigured things. But um, it was a garage rocket company, literally in yeah. the garage. Very hands-on, gritty, get it done, yeah. rather than the you know, white lab coat kind of thing. Over the years, Mastin has built up a reputation as a great place for young, hungry engineers to get their hands dirty with aerospace technology. We're talking small teams of five or six people building things like this. That's Zombie. It's not the prettiest spacecraft, but it proved that you could take off vertically, cut the engine, relight it, and land. This all happened back in 2010, well before SpaceX was landing rockets. And it caught the attention of one Elon Musk. That is a phenomenal email, and it's glad to have helped inspire it. <laughs> now, today, Mastin has got over 600 flight operations under our belt with these type vehicles. No one else has done 600 rocket landing operations, period. What Sean will not say is this. For years, Mastin has lived hand to mouth, going from one small contract to another. It hasn't been the best run or frankly, most viable business. In fact, Mastin kind of became known for getting passed by by the likes of SpaceX, Rocket Lab, and others. Which is why it was quite the surprise when NASA decided to give this tiny outfit $80 million this year to build a lunar lander. Mastin has a series of instruments that NASA has selected that we are going to deliver to the South Pole of the Moon in December of 2022. That's, that's soon. That is soon. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and so after a decade of building blocks and iterations, it's now go time. We're purchasing the ride to point us at the moon. So inside of a SpaceX inside firing? Of, yeah, and then our craft will do the corrections, bring us in, put us on the surface. And I think it's gonna fly nine scientific apparatus, is yeah. that right? We've got uh, instruments that are going to be trying to scan the surface of the moon from on the lander itself, but being able to execute that landing is gonna be the tricky part. And we've got a couple different landing sites that we're still kind of looking at. Despite the massive contract, Mastin's digs are as humble as ever. And it's grit, still very gritty. Are these guys getting ready for something? This is a small rocket engine test rig. Okay. This is where we learn and practice and get that real world experience that's not the stuff that's in the textbook. One of the beautiful things about operating in Mojave, we have a test site on the other end of the airport. You hook it up, you drive it out, you do the test. There's no getting on a plane, there's no shipping. It's right here. Part of the story of Mastin and being out here and, and being this um, hands-on place is that like things aren't things weren't always 
great, right? Because you're, you're dependent on a contract here and there. And so what's it been like keeping the business running all this time? It's been a challenge. Um, we will look at a project, we'll do an estimate, and we'll say, great, we'll do it for this amount. So when things go over, it's on us. The market, while there is commercial customers, the reality is there's still government dollars that are really the major driver. Now, with NASA kind of as the anchor customer for some of these missions, there's a market that's established. And in a broader sense, these next five years are going to set the standards for humanity's expansion beyond the planet. We will return American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term exploration and use. The current administration is super into the moon, and I mean, for you guys, this has all been pretty fortuitous. <laughs> yeah. Look, the moon is a topic of international sure. discussion and debate. Eventually, human beings will draw the moon into our economic sphere of influence. That is where humanity will be. And so the ones who get there to establish the services, whether it's communication, whether it's transportation, interfaces, or any of these things, the people who are doing it will get the chance to set those things now. Well, I see Elon's, Elon's now that there's money out there, he's, he's suddenly interested in the mood as well, so. Yeah, so, <laughs> and that's been, it is really cool to see the thing that you've been working on become popular, but really, Elon is very focused on Mars. Let's go to the moon first. You didn't say anything about the shirt, man. I uh, noticed immediately, <laughs> and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> is, the, is the lander like sitting in a, one of these warehouses? Or it, like what stage are we, we at? We, so we do have some hardware that's already coming in. Probably middle of next year is when you will have an actual thing together. And this will be getting information from the moon where Artemis is planning to land humans. Mastin survival seems assured for now. That's not always the case here in Mojave. Other space startups like Xcor have gone by the wayside. And companies like Virgin have spent more than $500 million trying to reach orbit with little success. The biggest risk takers, though, are humans like Elliot here, because he's a test pilot who volunteers to put his life on the line. The last time I saw Elliot was right after that crash, way back in 2016. He sat for an interview. To be the pilot for that test, they're not skills you can like just go get. He even took me flying. There's a couple of big bumps out there today. Woo! Yeah. He never let on that it was his first time back in a plane after the wreck, or that he was still wounded and uneasy. Because I'm a jerk, I asked Elliot to take me to the scene of the crash the famed Mojave Boneyard, where planes go to decompose. Tell me about this crash. You were testing out a plane, and I mean, tell me, tell me what happened. So this opportunity came out where a small jet engine company uh, was looking for somebody to debut their engine. We flew the airplane successfully two times, and then the third flight, we had an engine failure and I ended up uh, weaving my way between the tails of the uh, 747s here in the boneyard uh, until I could find a soft spot to put it down. At the end of the day, you know, the, the engine that failed was a prototype engine, uh, so you know, we, I knew the risks that I was getting into. You walked away, but you must have been shaken for a while after that. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, if, you're, if you don't walk out of that and think uh, about what you're doing with your life, you're actually probably have problems. But um, I was flying again within a few days of the accident and testing air. I had another major incident in an airplane, an emergency landing within a week of that, uh, uh, that one. So, so, you know, get back up on the horse. Have you considered shirtless beach volleyball? Not till this moment. <laughs> Unlike many test pilots with military training, Elliot is actually an engineer 
who's had to work his way up into the test pilot game. So there's basically two paths to flight test. Um, one is uh, you go be a fighter pilot, and then you go from fighter pilot to test pilot. The other is you go spend 10, 15 years with a small company, and you work your way from like an engineer to make that jump to the left seat. I just love, love this about your story, man. I mean, so you've got, you've got the guys you see in Top Gun, and that's kind of who you're competing against. Somebody's got a new plane, and then you got to go up against the Top Gun guy and explain to these people why you should fly the plane. Yeah, fundamentally. I remember we lost a program to an astronaut. I never even like made a counterpoint, right? Um, but now that I've been in this business for a while, like the science as an engineer is fascinating, right? Like you go and learn something in school, you can read it in a book, you can see how the equation works, but until you can like feel it in your hand and see how that all adds up to whether it is or is not what you want from an airplane, that's a whole nother level. And as a test pilot, I've flown 80 different kinds of airplanes successfully. I've got uh, 11 first flights. So that means you're like the first person to take the machine up. Yeah. Mojave's had this mythic status, you know, of, of this is where you come to do the, the most groundbreaking work and to, to push machines to their edge. I mean, is that is that still the case? I think there's no question that Mojave is absolutely on the radar right now. I mean, there's the whole world's watching to see what comes out of Mojave. This is very desolate land where you can play and do things you can't do other places on the planet. And it attracts like big ego dudes, like, yeah. you know, frontal lobe kind of guys. And to be able to get a bunch of smart dudes pointing in the same direction, go make something fly that doesn't look like it should, that's a hard thing. And yeah. it's very rewarding when it works. And when it doesn't, you can spend an eternity thinking about all how, how it all added up against you. And so here we are, pandemic, fires, the overall madness of 2020, which feels more and more like a work of experimental Dadaist art. And yet somehow I end up in the back of a pickup truck, driving through a plain graveyard during a Mojave sunset. It's not perfect because perfect can't exist right now, but I gotta tell you, it ain't bad. <laughs> 